Well, amen. Welcome, everyone. It's a nice, we're getting ready for winter, man. I don't know about you, but I kind of like it. Go to your, take your Bibles, go to Acts. Acts chapter 9. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at something for the next couple of nights. Uh, probably on Wednesday nights. Uh, this might be one of the only Wednesday nights we get to do this for just a little bit. Father, thank you for your blessings tonight. Thank you for allowing us to be in church. Thank you for a church to come to, Lord. What a blessing it is. Thank you for a Bible that we can hold our hands to show us exactly what uh, we should be doing and what we need to do. Uh, Lord, uh, I do pray now for those that aren't here tonight that, that for whatever reason, Lord, they're home, that you just bless them. Uh, I know we got some uh, shut-ins, Lord. I do pray for them, that you'd bless them and, and just encourage them. Everybody else, Lord, that, uh, that they'd be able to maybe just watch the, the services tonight and, uh, Lord, that you'd give them a special blessing. Again, thank you for the church, Lord. Just thank you for letting us be a part of the church. And, Father, we'll praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all keep my mom in prayer if you could. She's in the hospital right now. And, uh, there's, they don't know what's wrong with her. She's just hurting. She probably got something like Robin had diverticulitis or something similar to that. Whatever it is just hurts. And uh, she, it could be what's going around that everybody else has got going around. So uh, don't be kissing each other. I know they said a the holy kiss and all that stuff, but just uh, keep your distance. You know, that's good. So... Uh, Acts chapter 9, Paul is sitting here, uh, and I'm going to look at some of the things about the church, the local church. Local church is the strangest thing in the whole wide world you'll ever get in your life. It is weird. Uh, it, is, it is a unique organization, and it's an organism, but it's, it's a church. We had seven people join the church Sunday morning, so I wanted to, uh, to be a church, to join a church, to be part of a church. Uh, there's, a, there's a purpose behind that, and, and it is not for the lost world. Although lost people do come in and get saved, it's not for them. It never was for them. It's for the saved body. The danger is sometimes the, the, the saved body will say, it's me and my four and no more, and that's not what you're here for. That's not it either. So there has to be a balance there somewhere. So Paul, uh, Paul is probably, uh, he wrote 14 New Testament books. I believe Hebrews was written by Paul. So when you look at that, uh, you'll start seeing how the Lord Jesus Christ used Paul in a mighty way to write those books. But Paul is also a, a perfect example of how a Christian becomes a Christian. A lot of people don't get this, but that's how it happens. It isn't that you bring him in here and I preach at him. Now, Brother Dave, we Sunday morning, they, uh, uh, Sister Sue said Dave got to preach and, and two guys got saved. Uh, it was two guys, right? Not a girl and a guy? Not two, two men, Okay. There's no guarantee if those two people were in church on Sunday morning and or Sunday night or Wednesday night or whatever night it was, uh, if those two people were on, in church, somebody has been working into those two people's lives for a long, long time. It wasn't just that all of a sudden they come to church and didn't know nothing about anything. Uh, I, I don't think a person should walk into church and never get shocked. If they do, then somebody brought them in, and they never talked to them to start with. you got to talk to them, man. you got to tell them something. Uh, I preached at everything that moved in this world that, on the ships out there. They never were shocked. I was shocked when I heard people come in because I was afraid, oh, man, they're going to get offended. They never got offended. Uh, when I brought somebody in, they they'd already got offended by me anyway, so they didn't have to worry about getting offended. Paul is sitting here on the road to Damascus. Paul is, is going out to kill Christians. That's what his purpose is. I'm going to get them. I'm going to take them to jail. His name is Saul, by the chance. I'm going to take them to jail. I'm going to lock them up. I'm going to kill them. This is what I want to do. I want to, I want to eliminate this thing called Christianity altogether. Uh, somebody should not be in this body of believers that doesn't believe like we believe or is closely headed in that direction. If they are, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. There's where the problem lies. Uh, the church has to see that thing. Paul is sitting here, and, and it says, verse 1. Actually, let's look at exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Forget what I think. And Saul, yet breathing out uh, threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. So he's already out there in, in a group of people trying to get uh, the, uh, in the middle of the night, he's trying to get a, a warrant for arrest. And, and all this stuff without any facts. But that's okay, he don't care. And desired him letters to Damascus and uh, to the synagogue that if he found any of, of this way, that's our way, by the way. That's your way. That's the Christian way. That's people who are trusting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the way. Paul is out to get them. Uh, you know, the strangest thing about the world, I don't care how nice a person is, 
uh, when you start pinning them down on Jesus Christ, they'll really get mad at you really quick. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And, and the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Yeah, Paul, it is kind of rough. And he trembled, astonished, and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, uh, and it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. Father, again, thank you for your blessings tonight. Bless this message, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church is a strange thing. Uh, I got in it. The Lord wouldn't even let me in church for the first four years of my Christian walk. Uh, I was messed up. I mean, I was just messed up. There was just nothing about it. My mind was messed up. My thinking was messed up. If I got into a church, I would have messed it up. I wouldn't have understood what a church. I've sit in Dr. Jack Howell's church for the first two years of being saved. Didn't understand what was going on there. It was the weirdest thing in the whole wide world. I walk in, and they have this little section. That's a big old church, man. I mean, it's 10,000. They said at the time that they had the largest Sunday school, 10,000 on Sunday mornings. That's a big school. I never seen 10,000 there, but that's what they said they were. I don't know where these 10,000 people were. But they had this little section like right back here. They had pews here and pews here and pews here and pews here and pews here just as far as the eye could see. And there was this one little section where they put sailors. You talk about somebody get ticked off, that would be me. I'm like, why? That's like, that's like a, a racial thing for me. I mean, you're, you're, you're picking sailors out, and I didn't understand. You're picking sailors out and putting them over here, and why are you putting us over here? Is there something wrong? Do we stink? What is our problem? I didn't understand how the church worked. I had no idea how it worked. Uh, for four years, I went through this thing. You know what the Lord did for me for the first four years? Number one, he put me in a Bible that when that four years was over, I knew that the King James Bible was the Word of God. It didn't have nothing to do with church. It had to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew that this thing was the Word of God. Once I got the Word of God down, now, now I can fit into a church. Guess what he did? The very next step is he allowed me to join a church in uh, King James uh, Bapt uh, Bible Baptist Church in, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Pastor Ron Burris allowed me to uh, become part of that church. And when I got into that thing, I fit right in. What I realized is that, hey, I should never have been in that church unless I was saved. You know what's wrong with a lot of our churches? We'll downplay everything that we can downplay to get people in the church. That's not what the church is for. The church is to get us up out here somewhere where we can stand in this world, present evil world, and do what we're supposed to do. The Lord, now I'm, I'm looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how he works? The same way we should work. Most people will bring people into church and expect the pastor to win them. That's not my job. My job is to pray and to teach and to preach. That's my job. Now, I do a whole lot more than that, but that's my job. That's the basic job. That's what the Bible says of a preacher that's supposed to be the bishop of a church. That's their basic job. If, if I do everything, then what are you doing? you got to be doing something. I said, I give. I sit in a pew. Oh, aren't you going to talk about money? Money? Talk about money. Then I can say I do that. Nah, see, now here we're getting off the money thing. It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with service. And if you're going to learn how to serve, you need to learn how to serve. I was, I was thinking about this, uh, and whenever you have a group of people join the church, man, all of a sudden you're like, I've had people that I've worked with for 10, 12 years, had to get rid of them. You say, why? Because they never got all the way in. And they were more trouble for the body of believers than, I've had other people that come in and, and they have their way of doing things and they think that their way is better than everybody else's way. And I'm like, wait a second, but that's not the way that the Bible says, number one. Number two, that's not the way this body's headed. Number three, you're coming in here trying to cause division amongst the brethren. That's what you're not supposed to have. It's supposed to be unity. We're supposed to have unity. So if we're all headed in the same direction, you can actually get something accomplished. I saw my Brother Joe a few minutes ago. I said, what's wrong with most churches is they want to get lots of people in, and then you got this mess, a melting pot. No, no. What you do is you start at the bottom down here with one or two people, and you let God add to the church daily, like the Bible says, as he sees fit. Amen. Not as I see. When, you start, when I start seeing, what I'll do is I'll bring people, and then pretty soon you start liking them, and then you forget Sin is still sin. I had a, uh, my wife was talking to uh, someone the other day, and they said that they were talking to somebody, and they said, does your church still preach on sin? Mm, yes, we do. Sin is still sin. And there is a whole list of them, man. Just about anything you do is sin. You're breathing right now, that's sin. 
says, what? No, not your, your what? what no, uh, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have God, and you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You breathe in this trash that you blow in outside. And I said, you're, de you're destroying this temple. You get around somebody who smokes cigarettes, you're destroying this temple. Just about anything you do. I mean, you got to, okay, I, I know you can't get by with all that stuff, man. If you wear your mask, you know, okay. No. <laughs> it's proven the mask don't work. Uh, but that's okay. They still think it does. And they still want to make you do it. But anyways, Paul, Paul is sitting here. He's breathing out. See, it has nothing to do with sucking. It's the breathing out is where the problem's at. Uh, Paul is breathing out. I mean, he's railing against Christians. And the Lord says, guess what? I can't bring this guy into the church quite yet. Uh, he's not quite ready for it yet, but I can't really. I mean, if I bring him in, he's going to be breathing into the church problems. You know, it's enough problems in a church as it goes without bringing additional problems into it. And if you let the church grow the way it should do, then it'll, it'll be efficient as it's supposed to be and let the Lord do the thing. Jesus Christ identifies, and here in Acts, he's talking, but in 9-1, nine, nine, uh, it says Jesus identifies himself with the church. I like the way he says there. He says, hey, Paul, down in verse 5, and Paul goes, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, Paul was going after them of that way. Well, guess who he just met? The one that is that way. And guess what? You're going to make a change or you're not. You know, there were some people that the Lord came up to and he said, come and follow me. And they didn't do it. And the Lord went on. I like that, that, that thing Jerry just did. I, as a matter of fact, brother, I just read that today. I, it was in one of my other messages I was looking at. And it was right there. I was, I was going to do it. I said, no, nah, but you better be glad I didn't. I'm glad I didn't do it because you had already done it in me, but I could have done it the correct way. I don't know what the correct way is. It's, who knows what the correct way is? But, but you sit there, there's people, that, that thing he did was perfect because you sit there, all those stories are true in themselves. Combined like they are is, is, is wrong. Uh, he didn't fall, I, I like this, they, cast, they come and see Jezebel, cast her down 40 times, uh, 70 times 7. Like, wait, 70 times seven's in your Bible. That's how much you're supposed to forgive somebody. But, but what most people do is they take bits and pieces of the Bible and they put it together and they think they know something about the Bible. And they don't know anything about the Bible at all, but it sounds really good. It's funny and you laugh at it. You think that's good. Paul is sitting there not laughing. He's breathing out anger, bitterness, violence. He's out after the church. You know what the church's job is? The, the leaders of the church is to protect the church. My number one concern is to protect you guys. That's my number one concern. Uh, I'm, I'm watching that door and watching this door and any other door, and I'm looking for wolves in sheep's clothing, and I'm sitting there watching them and watching them and watching them, and I'm comparing them to the Bible the best I can, and I'm like, Lord, show me. And, and you bend over backwards to help people until you can't help them anymore, but, but you got to somewhere say, okay, there's a line that you just cross a line, and once you go across this line, there's nothing more I can do for you at that point. That's the church. The, that's the, in here. Now, out there on the side of the road, there is all kinds of things you can do. You can, you can mess with people all day long on the side of the road. This good Samaritan, guess what he did? He found a guy all beat up and bloody on the side of the road. He picked him up and took care of him. That's exactly what you should do. Uh, I had a nurse call me from the uh, uh, place where my mom is sitting today. And uh, my mom is trying to get back to Kentucky, and I'm trying to help her. Uh, you say, why is it? Because she's my mom, and I know who she is, and I love her, and I've, I've been dealing with her for 65 years. Definitely for the last 55. It's not that I mean, I just, she has a way about herself. And I'm sure your mothers and fathers had the same way about herself, themselves. And, and there's a difference between everybody. And I got a way about myself. And, and anyways, uh, the nurse called me and said, hey, your mom is this and that. And your brother called and he got all mad and blah, blah, blah. And we calmed him down. I said, yeah, that figures. I, she goes, well, your mom is, is having some issues, but she is eating. I said, I believe you guys are doing everything you're supposed to do. They left and went down there to see my mom, and my mom was sitting there uh, doubled over in, in pain and everything else in agony. And, and the nurse said, Mr. Elliott, I'd like to say something to you. I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, uh, you got the best wife, one of the best women I've ever seen in my life. She goes, as a Christian woman, she goes, she is probably one of the best Christian women I've ever seen in my life. I agree with that. I mean, I got a Proverbs 31 wife. Uh, you say, why is that? She goes, of all the people... In this nursing home, I see, uh, you put them all together, your wife visits your mother 
more than everybody else visits. She said, I see your wife in here every time I come in here. I said, yeah, I believe that because she's never with me. I got that, man. I got that. I told my mom that. My mom thought I was trying to, she was trying to break up my marriage. I said, here, I'm breaking up my marriage. But what, what it is is my wife is trying to do the right thing. And she's going, you know what she has more fun? She takes the donuts we have over here that you used to take all the time. Now she takes them to the nursing home. And she gives those people that are supposed to be on certain diets all this sugar. <laughs> that, that dropped her down from a Proverbs 31 maybe to a 30. I don't know, man. Somewhere in there. Maybe a Proverbs 30. Uh, but, but you sit there and look at this thing. The church, the church's job out there is to do, you're supposed to look good out there in the world. Man, you know what that did? This lady sitting there looking at it said, if I'm looking at a Christian lady, that girl right there looks like one. And she didn't say nothing about me. I don't know what. Maybe, she, she, maybe she's kind and generous, and that's okay. But the Lord is sitting here, and he says, the Lord is identifying with the church here. But the Lord is doing the initial work in the greatest Christian's life on the outside of the church. He's not doing it on the inside. Brethren, we got to get this thing down. If this thing is going to survive, we've got to watch everybody in here and everything that's going on. And we all have to grow. It isn't one of these things where, well, I just don't like it. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. What's the Bible say? And what do I, Lord, what will thou have me to do? If you're going to do this thing right, if the church is going to flourish, or we can become like any other church out there, change our hymn books to these uh, filthy, stinking uh, uh, choruses that they just sit there and la, 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 back and forth and don't get nothing out of it. The church is not supposed to be that way. We're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to grow beyond this stuff. And I think it's a great thing to do it. I, I, I learned that when I first, I mean, I, I sit there and say, Lord, why didn't you teach me? Why didn't you let me know the Bible? Why did you let my uncle take the Bible out of my hand right after I get saved? I had a King James Bible in my hand. I got saved out of a King James 1611. Didn't know it, but that's what I got saved out of. Why did you let him take it out of my hand and not put it back into my hand for four years? He goes, because you wouldn't believe it. You know what our problem is? Is we don't believe what God's doing for us. It has to be taken out of our life. Our hurt has to come in somewhere. You, something has to happen in longevity. A, amount of time has to go by to where you get to the place where you're like, all right, God's right. I got, I got me three hats. I went out to the brother Dave Spurgeon, uh, kind of put me under conviction. He came in with his hat, had an anchor on it, and he's, he's, he's bragging. He's a braggart, man. He's Look at my hat. Well, first of all, it has an anchor on it, and it matches the name of the church. So what are you trying to say, Dave? But anyways, uh, so I go out there, and I, this lady's out there. This black lady's out there, and she's got all these hats on sale. And, uh, and usually you go out there, and, and there's another group of people I found out that sell hats too. And they sell them for $22, $23 a hat. Well, I, I said, ma'am, how much is your hat? She goes, $12 a piece. I said, you got to be joking. She goes, no. I said, so what's if I buy three? She goes, they're $12 a piece. I said, so you don't, like, give me a deal on, on three? No. Well, I want to buy three. You want to give me? No. $12 a piece. So I found this hat, Proverbs 3. The first one had Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It said, and it says up here, it says, relax. God is in control. Yeah. Amen. I'm like, I like that, man. I said, if I'm going to wear a hat and it says Pepsi on it, I would rather wear a hat that says God is in control and have that on my head. I got one of the anchor hats, too. I didn't like that one too much because it was green. Got, got an army flavor look to it, man. I told the lady, I said, you need to get some of these in blue. I said, that, that, then they'll be better. But she laughed and I laughed and we had fun about it. But you know what? The, the Lord works on the outside of the church to get the greatest Christian that ever walked the planet into the church. And you know what we're supposed to be doing? Following his steps. We're supposed to actively be working on everybody outside this church. To get them ready to come into church. You know what I did with most sailors? I spent a lot of time in their lives to get them in church. So that they could walk in the door and not get offended. They still got offended a little bit here and there. But, I mean, not, not in any great thing. I remember Scott Flood, man. Uh, I was sitting there one time. Preacher was, I mean, he had this big old guy preach against me. I mean, he was mad at me. And he had, he had no right to be mad at me. In this case, he didn't. He wanted me to stay in Norfolk, Virginia. I wanted to go to Pensacola, Florida, go to Bible college. He wanted me to have a military ministry because that's what I was doing. But the Lord was saying, hey, I'm going to open the door for you down here to do this. So he had this big old guy, a big old missionary from Greece, preach at me. And he's down. And, and I'm over here taking care of the sound booth because our sound booth was up front. 
and, and the crowd's all out here, and he's preaching like this. So you kind of know exactly who he's trying to get their attention. And I'm like, <laughs> just laughing, because it, it just it, it's like duck on, uh, water on a duck's back, they say it rolls off. Uh, and it did. I, I, it had nothing to do with me. I had perfect peace about what I was supposed to be doing. I had evidence of the people I had in the crowd. Uh, I already knew what I was doing. I knew what the Lord wanted me to do. And it didn't really matter what anybody else said. I don't really care. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. But that's good preaching anyways. I amen him, man. Amen, 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 amen. I mean, you know what y'all do sometimes? Y'all just amen. It, it, it breaks you down. Well, halfway through the service, the service is over. Here comes Scott Flood down the hall, man, down the aisle, man. He's mad as a hornet. I said, Scott, what's wrong? <laughs> I said, Scott, wait a minute. If it don't, if, if the preaching didn't bother you, if the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Well, the shoe fit. You know, Scott's still in the ministry today. He's married to a young lady. He's a deacon in the church in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, he's married to a young lady, and they had five, maybe six kids. I don't know. I haven't kept up with how many he has. <laughs> Who knows how many they had? But I'm sitting there going, Scott's still there in a church today, retired chief. You know what I did? I made sure Scott got the truth. And on a ship out there, I would tell Scott what the truth was. And I got them trained up to where when they walked in, they weren't so. I like the way the Navy trains them. You go to school. This is the radio. Oh, man. See, not today. You don't have to worry about that because everybody's got one of these in their hands, so they know what a phone is. But back then, I mean, you didn't know what electronics was. So they have to start you off like with milk. And then they work you through, and by the time you get down to the end, it's a T-bone steak in 45 minutes, and we're going to throw a problem in this building, and you got to find that problem in 45 minutes or you fail. And the pressure's on. you got to be able to take the pressure. They couldn't take somebody who just walked in the door and throw them out here. No, you'd fail. They train them up. You know what we, we fail to do is train up people out there. The Lord is sitting here training Paul up. And he tells him in verse 6, he says, And he trembling and astonished, Paul got the message. Paul has enough background of enough Bible in him. The, the, he had the Word of God in him. He just didn't know what to do with it. It's like what Jerry was doing there. And that's a great passage. I, I like it. That, that, I, I need to do that again, man. It's a funny one. But, but as you're going down through there, it wasn't that Paul, Paul was just like that right there. He had all the information kind of jumbled up. The Lord said, let me straighten some of this stuff out for you, Paul. I am the I am. And you're kicking against the pricks. Do you got that? And he got Paul's attention. Paul's eyeballs was open up, and he knew that he's now wrong. But if you get over where Paul, you know, he writes over in 1 Corinthians 15, he goes, first three, he goes, Christ died. Isn't that great, man? Christ died for me so I could go to heaven. No, 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 no. Back up. Christ died for our sins. For all have sinned and come short of glory of God. That's Paul still talking. Christ died. For our sins, according to Scripture, according to the Bible, you're a sinner. Anybody who walks through that door is a sinner. You're either a saved sinner or a lost sinner. Lost sinners become saved sinners if they trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Somebody's got to teach them. Somebody's got to help them. Somebody's got to be the example to them. Somebody's, Beth takes some donuts over there, man. I'm telling you what, she, you know what she does? I call her, how's mom doing? Good, she's in the hospital. Typically, my mom would go to the hospital in Norfolk or in Louisville, Kentucky. She would go down there, and she doesn't understand triage. She doesn't understand levels of care. She doesn't understand all this stuff. She doesn't care. What my mom cares about is mom. And you, when I walk in the hospital, I'm paying you money, and you should take care of me first. I don't care if the guy's arm is cut off and blood's going. I don't care about that. I'm over here, and my toenail hurts. And I think you should take care of my toenail. And she will get up and walk out of the emergency room. And then wonder why she gets an ambulance bill, number one, and a Uber bill to get her back home, number two, and a hospital bill that she has to pay because she never waited for the insurance company to kick in. That's just the way my mom is. Beth is down there right now. I said, Beth, do not leave my mom. If you do, she'll leave. And she won't know where she's at. She's in North, uh, Louisville, or Dayton, Ohio, not Louisville, Kentucky. And she won't have a clue how to get back to where she's supposed to live. She needs to stay there until they tell her there's nothing wrong with her. But, but I'm sitting there, brother, there's a place where Paul is sitting here on the side of the road. And the Lord says, I can't just take Paul into the local assembly. And I'm going to show you that in here a second. It's going to scare them to death. Now, now, here you go. Here's the next thing. When you got a group of people here, you just can't allow somebody to walk in the building and do whatever they want to do. 
because you got everybody else sitting here that has rights to be here also. And they've already paid their dues, and you just got to watch that thing. And I've seen people come in, they think, well, I could tell. No, 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 you can't tell us what to do. I had a guy come in back here one time, and he stood up back. Oh, I just want to say, and he was trying to praise me. I'm like, shut up. I don't need your help to get any praise or anything. I can get it all. I, I don't need praise anyways. I just need slamming it more than anything else. I said, but I don't need your help. And I actually had to ask the guy to leave because he was nothing but a nuisance. And all he was doing is trying to break the service. This moment right here is for you to learn something and for me to say something. Hopefully that the two will work together and you'll learn something. You're supposed to get to where you walk with Jesus Christ by yourself. You have to have a relationship. Every service should be the same thing to get you a little bit closer to him. And if you read your Bible the way you should, what you're going to do is you're going to start seeing a a a pattern that the Lord chooses down through here to do what he says going to do. He cares about his church. That's his church. Lost people are not in his church. And if we sit there and try to bring lost people into the church, we're going to mess the church up. Now, if we're working on lost people, now let me, let me clarify that. If we're working on lost people and we bring them in, and we're working on, they're not going to be so stunned when they walk in. Well, I tell you what, to go to from the world to what we do here today, uh, I don't see how they could even begin to do it without a lot of work outside. Because this is going to be in their face. It's, it's okay. It's okay to do whatever you want to do in this world. You can do whatever you want to do. That's fine. You can be a boy or a girl or a girl or a boy or whatever you want to do. Uh, schools are teaching that. The, the government's already removed all the laws out of the way. Everything you want to do, anything you want to do, it's like all open. You listen to some of these debates, and it's amazing. The, the sides are so far apart, but it's really not far apart. Republicans are like right in the middle now. And the Democrats are like way over here somewhere. And we are like way over here somewhere. And it's like we're settling for the le lesser of two evils which I'm okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Anything, live peaceably amongst all men as you can. You know, I'm, I'm all right with that. Uh, if you quit trying to take all my money. The Lord does not work. I'm going to get back to this. The Lord does not work with Paul. The Lord did the work on Paul in the streets. That means outside the local church, the Lord was working. You know what we're supposed to do? When was the last time you passed out a gospel truck? I left mine in the background of this. When was the last time you passed out a gospel truck? When was the last time you tried to tell somebody about Jesus Christ? I went to a hospital uh, yesterday they had to do some checks on me down in uh, Miami South, and I was walking through, and here's this guy sitting there about halfway through. I, for some reason, I parked. I think the Lord does everything on purpose. I parked on the wrong side of the building, so I went in the wrong side of the building. I called. Uh, where am I at? I don't know where I'm supposed to be. And the guy told me, the security guy told me, and he walks me all the way through this, the, ha the, church, uh, the hospital. And halfway through, here's this guy sitting here, and, and he has a mask on, and you can see that there's concern in his face, but he's all by himself. I pulled out a holy Joe, man. That's all I got. I said, hey, let me give you something here to read when you get a chance. Then I left, and I went over there, got on the other side of the hospital, got all my tests around, I had to come back. Come back, and I walked by the guy, and he's still sitting there. I go, hey, did you read that track? He goes, I read half of it. I said, you going to read the other half? He goes, yeah, I'm going to read the other half when I get home. I said, my name's on the back. He said, what is that? I don't have to sit there and preach at this guy. I don't know where the guy's at. You know what he said? If he'd have said, hey, can you ask you a question? You ought to be always ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. And you listen to what the Lord says. But you got to be ready for that. So many times we think somebody else is going to do it for us and nobody else is going to do it. God put them in your path for you to do it. You can have help with other people. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I ain't going to do this. So then you go on down here. Saul rises from the ground. He does exactly what he's told to do. He goes into town. He's in a room. He, he can't see. He's blind for three days. And then the Lord goes to a guy. Now here, this is, this is the church. Down in verse 10 it says, And there was a certain disciple, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Ananias knew exactly who God was, the Lord Jesus Christ was. Ananias had a relationship with him. When the Lord started talking to him, the Holy Spirit started talking to him, Ananias knew who exactly who it was. Ananias answered. So that tells you right there. The Lord uses a disciple. I put a little note on the top of my Bible. The Lord uses a disciple named Ananias to bring Paul into the church. The Lord's going to use somebody to bring him. But Paul's already getting primed for this thing. 
Ananias goes and starts talking. In verse 11 it says, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire uh, in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias. He said, Ananias, I've already done the footwork for you. I've already talked to Paul to knock him down, to beat him up. He knows he's kicked and gets a prisk. He's, he's primed. He's ready. He's ready to hear the word of God. He's ready to get his heart right. If he hadn't already got it right, but he's ready. He's ready to move in. We're ready to get him in. Ananias, and, uh, there's 13. And then Ananias answered, Lord, like he doesn't really know, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority, he's got the papers in his hand, from the chief priest to bind all that call on his name. You know what Ananias doesn't know here? That the Lord's already been working his heart. You cannot do it. God has to. Where we mess up is we try to do everything our way. And our way don't always work right. What we need to do is it his way. Ananias has got the heart. He's got the mind. He's got the ears. He's listening, and he goes on. Uh, and here he hath authority, verse, verse 15. But the Lord said, you know what Ananias does at this point? He shuts his mouth. But the Lord said unto him, go that way. I want you to go to the street down there, do what I told you to do, to bear my name before. Uh, he said, go that way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. It would almost take the Lord to do that in somebody's life for Paul to understand exactly what he's got to do. Uh, Paul's got to grow. Paul's going to end up in a prison cell in Rome and then eventually get his head cut off. And all the stuff he's going to be stoned and left for dead and, I mean, beat and shipwrecked and all kinds of stuff uh, over the period of his Christian life to get the gospel to us, to protect that church. You know what Paul's doing? He's writing books to protect that thing that the Lord Jesus Christ died for. You know what we're supposed to do is protect that thing that the Lord Jesus Christ died for. My job is to protect what the Lord Jesus Christ died for, not to destroy it, not to get it bigger. I don't care about it getting bigger. But you know what I've watched? If we let this thing grow as it's supposed to, the natural way, God will add to the church as he sees fit. And if you let him do that, you'll never have to dismantle the thing. You know what's wrong with most churches? They get out here and they build them and they get big and they got to dismantle them. They never will because they can't let go of what they think they got and they really have nothing at all anyways. Right. You let go of that thing. You, know, you don't get there. You don't ever do that. You start down here at the bottom and say, look, I got a Bible. Lord, if it's just me and you and that's it for the rest of my life, I'm happy with that. And if everybody else rejects me, that's okay. I'm going to do like Noah did. I'm going to try my best to build an ark for my whole life. And I won't have no 120 years, and I, my boat won't look like his boat, but I'm going to try to just get through this life and do what you tell me to do. And if somebody will come along, then let them come. And if they won't, then that's their problem. That's not mine. I, said, I told the Lord that on a ship one time. I said, man, I'm, I'm done with this. I said, let them go to hell. He said, oh, it's awful mean. I said, no, I tried everything in the world my way, and it didn't work. I said, okay, here's the deal. You, you either mess with them and you get them, or they go to hell. I'm done. I said, I'll preach it. Everything moves. I said, after the first or second, you know what the Lord told me? He goes, you idiot. He said, you are a moron. Now, I don't know how he talks to you. He probably talks, oh, I'm so glad that you spend time to talk to me. Well, when he talks to me, he's like, you are an idiot. And I'm like, yes, sir, you're right. And he goes, did not I tell you in the Bible? And you wait for a minute like, yeah, well, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. Exactly what part of the Bible are you talking about you told me? <laughs> I mean, everything in there you're like telling me. He goes, ah, after the first or second admonition, reject him as a heretic. I said, that's a nice verse. I like that, man. That actually makes sense. You can't do it, Mike. And if I'm not working with him, you're wasting your time. Go beat your head against the wall. I said, no, I've already been there, done that, got the, got the headache, got the Motrin bottle, man, empty Motrin bottle for that. After the first or second admonition, I said, okay, that's good. I got it. If they go to hell, they go to hell. It's not my fault. If I have done what I was supposed to do after the first or second admonition, I'm supposed to back away. I said, here's what I'll do, Lord. I will preach it, everything that moves. I'll tell everybody once or twice at least that I know of. I, I may miss a few here and there, but I, I mean, the bulk of them I'm going to tell once or twice. And then I'm going to shut up. To them, 
Now, that won't stop me from talking to nobody else. But if they come and ask me, then I will talk to them. You know what I found out? Is they'd start coming talking. And when they started talking, I could get them a little bit closer to Jesus Christ. You know what's wrong with most people? Is they sit there and talk and talk and talk and talk about everything but Jesus. You know what saves people? Jesus Christ. You know what gets people on a conviction? Conviction? Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction in. But boy, when you start talking about Jesus Christ, that's the one they don't like to hear about. They hate to hear about, oh, let's talk about the little baby at Christmas time that Mary holds in her arm. That's, that, all that is is fluff. They don't want to talk about the risen living Savior, the one that was hanging on the cross and died for my sin, my wicked, filthy sin. They don't want, they don't want that. Then they don't want to build a relationship with him. Because when you do, guess what you got to do? You got to deal with your thing. Paul, could you imagine Paul for that first three days? He's blind, laying there in a, in a place. He can't see, and his whole life is just going through his mind. I just met. I would, I would, have, not, I would imagine that Paul was probably at the crucifixion. If he was that high in the level where he was at, I would imagine he was right there, and he, he watched that thing happen. Uh, I could be wrong, but I would imagine he was there. Uh, he was consenting unto Stephen's death, so he was right there at that one. And, he, and all of a sudden you said, man, Lord, I just met you and I've been killing Christians for the last 10 years. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. I'm, oh, my, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? <laughs> what have I done? Here comes an Ananias. Ananias is scared. You know what you got to realize? I'm going to tell all of us. Here's a church. When you bring somebody in here that's lost, that doesn't show any inkling of being saved or, or trying to find after, walk after Jesus Christ, you scare other people. You scare people. It's not the purpose to scare the people. You know, what? you got to calm the thing down sometimes. You know what the Lord does to Ananias? He calms him down. He says, Ananias, stop. I, I'm telling you, I'm working with this. You know what people have to see is God working in somebody's life. They have to see his hand in their life. If I can see the hand in the life, man, I'll work with anybody for 10 years. But the moment I see that hand change and the life go away, I'm done. You got you to gotta be able to stop it. You can stop it after two minutes or 10 years. It, it doesn't matter. Whenever that person stops doing what they're supposed to do, you got to remember as it was in the days of Noah, there came a day when the Lord shut Noah in. Noah didn't lift up and crank that thing in and bring the door up. No, no, no. Noah got in, and once all the animals were there, he shut the door and, and sealed that thing up from the outside and brought the rain, and everybody outside that ark died. Why? Because they did not want God. It wasn't that they didn't want Noah. They didn't want God. Otherwise, they'd have got on the ark. You know what we got to do? We got to realize that everybody out there does not want the Lord. Our job is to still give them the Lord, and get it. I go down here at uh, Kroger's, and they got a billboard on the way out. And if I have any chick tracks in my pocket, which I try to keep in my pocket now, the, I'm, I'm trying to convince myself, Ellie, you got to get back to this. You got to get back to this. I'll go up to that billboard, man, and I'll start putting chick tracks on that billboard, on that, on that uh, court board. And every, every time I go into Kroger's, I'll look up there and make sure, and if there's none up here, I'll put some more up. And you know what? Every time they're gone. And I'm sitting there going, I wonder if Kroger's is throwing them away. You don't know. You don't know. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep putting them up there. Why? Because nobody's, nobody's told me not to do it. Nobody's put a no solicitation there because that's what the board's there for, solicitation. Uh, everybody else is trying to solicitate. Why can't I solicitate? So I put my tracks up there. You all you ought to find a place to do it. And people will read those things, man. They'll go by to them. And the Lord uses a, na a disciple named Ananias. Before Paul can be brought into the church... Paul has to deal with his past. He can't just walk in the church as he is without dealing with his past. He has to deal with his past, accept his past as it is, and get that thing under the blood of Jesus Christ, or, or he is going to be a detriment to our church or any church. What's wrong with, and I've been in a lot of churches, and very few of them stop anybody. They'll, they'll take anybody. We had a, a sister here. Bobby's mom actually joined the church. And I felt sorry. I, I, I was, we, the last time we had a big church gathering where we had a bunch of people, she came up. I'm like, oh, God. I said, I don't want to say no to her. Everybody else is joining. I said, I don't want to say no to her. But I said, I said, she just went through the death of her son. And I said, man, I can't, 
I said, so I'm going to let her do this. And then I'm going to sit down with her back there, and I'm going to go through this thing. And I sit down with her back there in the back, and I said, sis, I said, I got to know. I said, I'll let you join the church today, but if you're lost, you really should be joining the church. She goes, I'm saved. I said, explain it. And she gave me a good te- uh, testimony of how she got saved and everything. I said, I'm done with it, fam, man. I said, I don't care. She's been coming every Sunday morning. She'll be here for the last year, man. She's practically been here every Sunday morning. And you say, what is that? I, before I did something and because I cared enough about her and her son and Joanna, I said, I'm going to let this lady go on and do this because I'm, I'm not going to call her down in front of everybody. But before she gets out of this building today, I'm going to find out. And if she's not saved, I'm going to make sure she is. And I let her join the church, and it was a good thing, and, and she got baptized. And, and she asked me, she get, I, I, I don't think you ought to baptize anybody either if they're living like the devil. I had somebody ask me that, and I said, no, you can't. Because what it does is it sends mixed signals to everybody else. Now, brother, we're in a crowd, and you got to remember when you do something in this crowd or any crowd, what you do is you send a signal. You want to send a positive signal, ne- never a negative one if you can stop it. And if I do something, allow something to happen, that's why I'm very cautious on what I do. You can ask my kids. I love all my kids. But I am, I'm as just as hard on them as I am anybody else's children or sons or daughters. Why? Because I can't send mixed signals that my kids get favored. I've had somebody say, well, yeah, unless you're an Elliot, you ain't going to. That's not true. If you want to sing, hey, I'll tell you what, man, look at this. Y'all stay right where you are. Don't go in the way. I got a cello. If you want to play a cello, it's right there. I've got violas. I got trumpets. Let me see what I got over on the other side. I bought all these, by the way. I got a tuba over here if you want to play a tuba. I got a whole bunch of other stuff over here, too. Guitars and everything. I got... I got baritones. I got French horns. What do you want to play? Don't tell me you got to be an Elliot. No, I'll tell you what the problem is, is you want to blame somebody else for not being involved. I've done everything I can to get you involved. We put a piano up, got an organ. Put the organ up here. A lady got down one day and said, I don't want to play the organ no more. Guess what? Another man stood right up in the crowd and said, oh, yes, I didn't think God would ever let me do anything ever again. Ah! I should have charged him. I could have made some money on that deal. I'll let you do it for $10 a week. (laughs) I'd have never got it. Paul is sitting here just scared to death. Three days, I mean three days. And guess what the Lord is working in Ananias' life. Ananias has got a Lord, man. This guy's going to scare a lot of people. The Lord says, I got it, man. I will work this thing out across the crowd. I'll work it out. Paul had to deal with his sin. His, his past had to be dealt with. Before somebody gets saved, they've got to realize they're a sinner. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Then, then you've got to get to a place where, hey, man, if I believe I'm a sinner, the sin has to be toward him. It can't be, who cares about you guys? The sin has to be pointing toward God. My sin is against him and nobody else. It really doesn't matter. I mean, like Al Capone, man. Al Capone said, if I ever do this again, he's in prison when he said this. If I ever do this again, I'm going to get a license. Because then it'll be legal. (laughs) I can get away with it. But you can't get away with it with him. I had to come to a place at 22 years old where I realized that my sin was between me and him. And there's the problem. Now, how am I going to deal with this problem? I didn't need a church. I had an uncle that was a Southern Baptist preacher. I never went to his church. Never desired to go to his church. But when I had a question, I went and asked him. Rolf, I found this Bible in my attic. It says this right here. What's that mean? He had opened up the door. I'd be outside the door. Never walked in his house. So what's that mean? He'd say, Mike, it means this and this and this. I said, thank you. My hair's down here. 68 Mustang, back across town. I'd read some more. A couple, two or three days later, it just seemed, in preaching, I mean, in my preaching, it sounds like I was over every day. I really wasn't over every day, but... I mean, whenever I had a question, the Lord hit me something, I'd go over and ask Rolf. You know what Rolf was doing is he was preparing me for salvation. And he was giving me the information I needed. And he was giving me the hope that was within him, he was giving that to me. And as he, the more he gave me, the closer I got. And the more he gave me, the closer I got. One day, I got it. 
And I went over there bawling my eyeballs out, crying and just could. God's not a respecter of any person. He's no different for me than he is for anybody else. I was looking for Jesus Christ. There was a day I really wasn't looking, but it took time for me to get there. You know, if we don't do our job on the streets, you can't do it here. There, it becomes a nightmare here, and you got you to stop that thing. Paul is sitting here laying there, and Ananias goes, and in verse 17 it says, And Ananias went his way, entered into the house, put his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord's already showed me. Ananias has got over his fears, but he had the initial fears. If the Lord hadn't talked to Ananias, Ananias would have never allowed Paul to come into the... the because back then, the, it was so critical that if you didn't watch what you were doing, somebody like that could come in and destroy this entire body and never think nothing about it. This body would be dead in a prison cell somewhere, getting ready to be beheaded. That's what Saul would have done to this thing. Satan is not, he knows you can't do that in this country anymore, but he can bring a lot of other stuff in to destroy it. You know why you grow in grace and knowledge? So that you won't be the one he uses to do that. I can, I can take you over to Psalm. There's, yay, six things God hates. Seven is an abomination. And he lists seven things off. You know what you ought to do is try not to do that to them seven. So in discord amongst the brethren right here, sometimes you could do that. I think, I think you, ought to, you ought to work with anybody and help them the best you can. Ananias does that. Paul gets baptized. Paul starts preaching on the streets, man. He's getting his out. Yes, praise God. Hallelujah, man. Everybody there. Now he goes to another place, Jerusalem. Verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he is saved to walk into the, the local Baptist church there. Hey, everybody, it's me, Saul. I'm here. Uh, they didn't want him around. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he is, he is, saved, he is saved to join himself to the disciples. There's nothing wrong with that. He, you know, he, he wanted to be part of the, part of the group, uh, but he wasn't there yet. But they were all afraid of him. You got to remember, brethren, when sinners are sinners and they come in, we got children, we got everything else we're worried about. Uh, I got ladies coming up to me about stuff, and I'm like, <sighs> I'm like, oh, God, man. I said, I got to deal with something. I got to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I said, I got to deal with it. How can I deal with it to where the whole body doesn't get hurt? But I said, I still got these moms. And I got these little bitty ones. And he says, you, you hurt one of these little ones. He goes, you hurt one of these little ones. It would be better for you to just go jump in the stinking ocean and go right to the bottom. Because if I catch you and I'll come find you at the bottom, go talk to Jonah. Done took him there, done brought him back. I'll bring a well down there and swallow you up, bring you back up on the shoreline, and then I'll deal with you there. I'm like, Lord, <laughs> oh, man. I said, you, gotta, you ought to try being a pastor sometime. This is just a small crowd. Could you imagine three or four? I wouldn't want three or four hundred. Unless we started with one or two, three or four, five or six, eight or ten. 20 or 30, 40 or 50, and they all come up through this thing the exact same way, and they all agreed. I'm not saying we're all going to be on the same levels, but we all believe the, practically the same thing. The, they were afraid. I don't blame them. They were afraid. Here's Saul. He's a murderer. He's a killer. He's a sinner. He's a sinner. And when Saul was come, he essayed, but at the end of that thing, it says, all, but they were all afraid of him. And believed not that he was a disciple. You know what Paul had to do? There was nothing he could do. Not a thing. His testimony doesn't count. Nothing counts. You know what Paul had to do? Verse 27. But Barnabas. Good old Barnabas. <laughs> Barnabas is a cool guy, man. I like Barnabas. Barnabas took him, brought him to the, the apostles. Would you stick your neck out for somebody? in a crowd of believers and convince them that he's one too? Put your, put your name on the line. Put your name on the line that if this guy does anything wrong to this body, I will take the blame for it. That's what Barnabas is doing right here. And he doesn't necessarily say all that, but Barnabas took him, brought him to the, all the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and, that, and he knew Paul's testimony, and he was a witness to Paul's testimony. And because of what he did, brought Paul into that crowd, and you got 14 New Testament books because of that man. Now, Paul is the greatest Christian you've ever seen in your life. 
But before Paul could become part of the body of Christ, he had to have a witness that he was a Christian. Brethren, we got to be careful who we bring in and out of these doors. There's nothing wrong with bringing lost people. I think lost people should come in. I, I'm not saying that. But if they're not already worked on and worked on and worked on to where they're thinking, then, then they have to be thinking about Christ and they got to be learning. If they're just coming in to cause trouble, then you don't want them here yet. Not yet. Not yet. And from there on out, Paul starts doing it and he starts wreaking havoc and they got to drop him down on a, a thing, get him out of the city and all this. I didn't even get into the message, man. Uh, Jesus identifies himself with the church. That's what he's doing. And Jesus cares about the church enough, and I'll stop right here. Jesus cares about the church enough that what he does is he works with a man on the streets. And he gets the man exactly where the man needs to be so that the man is ready to accept what he has to offer. And what he's going to do is he's going to make that apparent to him through the church. That's, what, that's how valuable this church is. That's how valuable a church is. The church of Jesus Christ is us. And the Lord's not going to do anything that's going to hurt this. Now, he may make us suffer. He may put some stuff on us to change us and to move us in the right direction. But he's not out to destroy this thing. He's out to build it. So you know what we got to do? We got to work with people on the outside so the Holy Spirit has time to work with them. I can't even begin to tell you how many guys on them ships out there. I wish I, wish I had a video of the USS Scott. I left that ship mad. I told this story before. I left that ship mad. Scott Flood was still lost on that ship when I left that ship. Three months into that thing, Scott pulls up to the church. I seen his little red 72 uh, Chevelle black vinyl top on it pull up. Uh, and I knew exactly whose car that was. And Scott came in. He sit through the whole service. You know what Scott could do? Scott could sit through the whole uh, Ron Burris is worse than I am. Scott Flood sit through an entire service with Ron Burris. Ron Burr's a big old fat guy, man. I got, well, I, I keep thinking he's fat, but he's bald-headed, getting all mad. I've seen him mad this close to his face, man. He's just mad, and, you know, like he's going to kill you. And uh, he just, he's just an old guy, man. He's pretty good. But anyways, uh, Ron preached and preached. Brother Burr's preached and preached and preached. Uh, Scott never did get mad. Scott never got up and walked out, and Scott never did anything. At the end of that service, I walked Scott up, introduced him to Ron Burr's. I left, went out, and started praying. Scott, I come back, Scott saved. I said, Scott, I was mad at him. I was going to kill him. You're going to go to heaven anyways, absent from the body, present of the Lord. I'm done with you, man. I spent three years on you. I said, why didn't you ever get saved while I was on the ship? He goes, because you never ask. I said, Lord, is that what you're trying to teach me? I th he goes, Mike, and Scott said this. He said, Mike, he said, for three years, every time I came to you on that ship, and I'd be in turmoil in my heart and soul. And, and I'd say, this, this. And you'd break that Bible out, man. You'd start showing me stuff on the Scott. I mean, you said Scott. I don't know how Scott got on the Scott, but Scott was on the Scott. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'd show him stuff. I just always thought that if you just told everybody, that they would just get it. I didn't realize it's like fishing. You know, if you go fishing and you throw a bobber out there with a worm on the hook, and you watch the bobber do this. If you keep watching that bobber do this long enough, it'll eventually do this. You know what? The fish done ate the bait, and you lost the fish, but he got the bait. You know what Scott did? He got the bait for three years. And at the end of three years, I left the ship. The Lord was teaching me some things, and he's teaching Scott some things. He said, number one, Scott. I said, Scott, why did you come here? He goes, because... Because every time I felt bad on the ship, I could come find you. And you would tell me everything, and I would walk away feeling better. He goes, but you left the ship. And he goes, I started feeling bad. And there wasn't nobody to make me feel better. It took him about three months. The Lord showed me this. Scott knew exactly where I was going to be at on Sunday morning. Does everybody know where you're going to be on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights? Scott knew exactly where I was going to be. On Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights. And that particular Sunday morning, you know what would have happened if I hadn't have been there? Scott may not have come in. Scott sees my car in the parking lot. Scott pulls in. Scott gets saved. Lord says, what is it? The mic at your testimony. Scott could sit through that service because Scott had heard me on the ship talk to him for three years. 
14 or 15 guys got saved right after that. Bam, 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 bam. They're all still out there today. One guy isn't. One guy isn't. Leffler. Leffler, I said I was going to be done here, but I lied. Leffler got saved. He's a Lutheran. And he wasn't, didn't know enough about the Bible yet, but his mom and dad tried to talk him out of getting saved. And they gave me a nice Bible cover. I got it over to the house, man. His dad made a nice real level, leather Bible cover with hands praying on the front and all this other good stuff. And uh, because they were thankful that, but their son, when he started getting into this thing, uh, they didn't like it. They didn't like him going all the way. I mean, we don't want you to go all the way with Jesus. We don't want that. We want you to be just like this lukewarm kind of mushy, mushy, mushy Christian. But Leffler started getting into it. So I was down to Piers one day, and I was walking to Piers. Piers probably about this wide, as wide as this building. And there's ships on that side, and there's ships on this side. And I was walking down this side, and Leffler started coming down through here. He got off Scott, and I was, I was going on the Ponce. And he gets way over there, and he walks away from me. And he goes, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. I said, done what? He said, I shouldn't have got saved. I shouldn't have got saved. My whole family, everybody's mad at me. I should have got saved. Two weeks later, that kid was dead. He was dead. He got sick, got spinal meningitis. He went to bed on a Friday night in his bed. He didn't have duty, so nobody checked on him all week. By the time they found him at muster on Monday morning, he had done burnt his mind up in that bed with fever. They got him to the hospital, and a, a couple days later, he was dead. And the Lord said, that's what happens when somebody rejects me after they get it. He knew what he got, but the little kid didn't know it. I'll get to heaven. You know what? Left will come up. He'll be one first ones to come up to me and said, "Brother, thank you for what you did, man. At least I'm here. You know, I'm, and I've been waiting for you to come up here. You know what the church's job is? Is to train the disciples how to be disciples in the world, so that in the world you can tell people about Jesus Christ, so that that the Lord can, the Holy Spirit can work in their lives, and and He will add to the church daily, as He sees fit." not as we see. We can't ever determine who is going to be that next one. And we can't make, what we got to do is we got to get in, stay in, and be where you're supposed to be so that when a Scott flood that you've been working for comes in, he'll come in and you'll be sitting right where you're supposed to be sitting. I'm not saying you're always going to be happy, but you need to be where you're supposed to be. The question is, is who are you doing it for I'm doing it for Jesus. I've been doing it for 43 years with Jesus. I'm going to continue to do it for 43 years. I didn't even get through my message. I didn't even get off page one, this one. I didn't even get off that. I just did that right there. I didn't even get all that. Wait a minute. Paul's testimony, finally, I'll finish right here. I will say this. I'll be done. I promise. Paul's testimony was the final thing to prove to the body of Christ he was to become part of the church. Before somebody becomes part of the church, there's a couple things they need to do. They need to, number one, trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they, that needs to be known of them. Then they become a member of the church. I never, I, it's a hard, I mean, ask Tim. I, it's a hard time for me sometimes to let people join the church. Sometimes you've got to ask, uh, and then if I forget about it, uh, like Sunday was Brother Matthew asked me if he could join, but he got hurting last week, so he couldn't do that. So we put it off to this week. And uh, the Sunday, and, and when he did, everybody else came up too. That's okay. I normally don't do it forever because I just think if you're here, I still got the same problem I had with Scott on the Scott. I still, if you're here, you're in the church. But, you know, for you, sometimes you need that, I'm going to be part of this. And that's what they all did. That's what, that's what uh, Bobby's mom did. She just wanted to be part of this. And I didn't want to stop her. But the Lord said, but you don't know. And, what did she, and I'm telling you what, she's been a blessing. She got baptized. She came up and said, hey, I, you know, I was baptized as a Catholic, and I need to get baptized again. I said, well, that's good, man. You know what? You tell most Catholics that, they'll get mad at you. Your baptism at birth didn't count. She didn't care. She goes, aren't you supposed to get baptized like after you get saved? I said, well, yeah. She goes, well, I need to get baptized. I'm thinking, that's cool, man. I like that. I said, I, I could use like a dozen of her. And uh, I, so we baptized. So I said, hey, I'm going to baptize her and I had some more wanted to get baptized. My other daughter, Elizabeth, or Jesse, I think it was Jesse, she wanted to get baptized at the same time. She said, well, Dad, you know what that did? That encouraged someone else to do it. That's the way the church works. And a church, I'm going to get back into this uh, probably, be, I may even do it Sunday night, but, uh, because I won't be here next Wednesday. But that's the way a church, a church is here to, to edify 
the brothers and sisters in Christ, and build them up and lift them up. And to, to, we preach at the lost and, and work with the lost, but 90% of the work is always going to be done outside the church. And the Lord Jesus Christ showed you that. If the greatest Christian had to be worked with outside the church, are we working with those outside the church that we're supposed to be working with? Father, thank you for your blessings tonight. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the, the testimony that you have and the examples, one right after the other, all through our Bible. Lord, I do pray now for those that uh, aren't here tonight that you just bless them. Be with the prayer service here for the next couple of minutes. And we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to say thank you for, I know there's several of you praying for me while I was sick and <clears throat> not 100% there, but uh, feel a whole lot better than I did a few days ago. So thank you for that.